This is Dr. Neil Burney. He lives in Bermuda, a stunning Atlantic island 640 miles east of North Carolina, USA. So now I'm leaving. Yeah. He spent the last 30 years practicing veterinary medicine, but now he's transferring his veterinary skills to help save, protect, and learn more about the incredible marine life of Bermuda's ocean. This is a completely wild shark. Alongside his dedicated ocean vet team are a number of scientists, yeah, this and here, marine this biologists, off the back fin. and specialist master divers, helping to perform a number of unique and dangerous procedures in a bid to safeguard critically important marine species. Together, the team will be fitting satellite tags to huge tiger sharks, saving precious green turtles, dissecting giant blue marlin and obtaining unique toxin samples from 45-ton migrating humpback whales. Yay! Whoa! My knees are like jello. Yes, man. This is Bermuda, home to Dr. Neil Burney, the ocean vet. The Bermuda black grouper is one of the most famous grouper in the world. They are synonymous with Bermuda's pristine and crystal clear waters. These fish are vitally important to the ecology of Bermuda's marine ecosystem and as such have been monitored for several years. Yep, there's our fish. 58527. In this special episode, the Ocean Vet team will be working with the Department of Fisheries to monitor and protect Bermuda's critical black grouper spawning grounds. Good to go. Neil will also be visiting an old friend who lives at the Bermuda Aquarium. Oh, this is Darth Vader. And testing new and less invasive tagging methods to lower the impact of future tagging studies. We planted the tag in him, opened the door and watched him swim away without a care in the world. It was a fantastic experience. Over several days at sea, the team will be put through their paces as they set out to ensure the protection of Bermuda's precious black grouper spawning grounds. I'm on the roof of the Bermuda Aquarium, and I'm gearing up for a rather special dive. This is the 530,000 liter North Rock Tank. It's home to sharks, jacks, barracuda, and most importantly, to my friend, Darth Vader, an 80 pound Bermuda black grouper. It's gonna be a unique opportunity to show you more about this important species. And frankly, I can't wait to get in. As an island veterinarian, Neil has developed a close relationship with many animals, including other individuals at the Bermuda Aquarium Museum and Zoo. Aha! But this massive black grouper has always been one of Neil's favorites. Oh, this is Darth Vader. He's very old. He's very wise. I've known him for nearly 20 years. There are thousands of these groupers patrolling the coral reefs around the Bermuda platform. The Bermuda Department of Fisheries has spent the last 10 years protecting these patrolling grouper. So Tammy just put a tag in there. That's number 282. Tagged fish send their location to receivers positioned over the grouper's breeding sites. I'm just using... This enables the Department of Fisheries to map the exact spawning location and enforce a precise fishing ban where these fish breed. This year, the Department of Fisheries and the Ocean Vet team are working together to reassess the size of the Southwest grouper spawning grounds. The team are now over the protected area and preparing for a rather deep dive. So we're here at the Southwestern grouper grounds. This is one of Bermuda's protected areas. 
and I'm here with Dr. Tammy Trott, Senior Marine Resources Officer. So, Tammy, what can we expect on this dive? Well, Neil, I'm expecting that you'll see lots of groupers down there. The dive is about 110, but the groupers will come up off the bottom, so you should be able to see them at about 80 feet. Excellent. Um, yeah. So, and that's that's a fairly technical dive. We're going to be a little careful. Drew and I are going to be watching out for each other. But this is going to be super cool. We're going to get you some great footage. So let's get ready, get in the water. Excellent. OK, diver going in. Diver in the water. As always, Neil is supported by his trusted ocean vet team. Choi Ming is the series marine biologist. Dylan Ward and Oscar Doyce are assisting with all topside operations, and Andrew Kirkpatrick is the team's underwater videographer. Okay, so I'm heading down. The visibility is perfect, and I can just see the bottom. My depth gauge is reading 40 feet. Diving to 110 feet reveals a whole new and exciting alien world. I can't wait to reach the bottom. These protected sites are vitally important to the future of the Bermuda Black Grouper. They arrive at these deep sites each year to breed in such concentrations that without protection, fishermen could easily remove an entire population. I'm just hitting the thermocline, the line where cold water meets the wall. The grouper seems to like the cooler water, and it's thought the water must be a certain temperature for spawning to occur. Possibly one of the reasons why spawning occurs here. I'm at over 110 feet here in one of the most alien landscapes I've ever seen. This maze of coral provides the perfect shelter for these big fish, a truly magical location. On a yearly basis, these spawning sites change in size and sometimes shift location. The only way to provide complete protection while these fish spawn and to assess the breeding numbers is to annually tag more fish. It's tricky keeping up with these fish as they're being scared by the bubbles shooting out of the scuba gear. The larger fish are almost certainly male and the smaller ones female. Question! Who do you who is right? So we have just had an opportunity to swim with several hundred black grouper. Phenomenal. Probably, ah, I don't know, hundreds, hundreds of them. Biggest one, at least 100 pounds, and we've got it all on camera for you. Now, I can't wait to get bait in the water, capture some of these fish, get some acoustic transmitters in them, so we can track their movement around this aggregation site. We right. found our grouper aggregation, we must be... Before the team up. brings one of these fish up for the standard tagging procedure, Neil is deploying a new tag trap designed to lower the invasive nature of the standard tagging procedure. So the standard method of tagging these fish is to bring them up to the boat at the surface, and we are going to do that, but we're also going to try a new method, and that is to try and put the tags in the fish below the surface of the water. And for that, we're going to use this. This is a modified Bermuda fish pot, and we've put portholes in it to allow us access to these fish so that we can actually implant a tag in the fish from outside. If Neil's trap works, it will reduce fish stress and stop barotrauma, a condition where gas expands in the fish's body as it's brought to the surface for tagging. Ready? One, two, three. With the trap deployed, attention quickly turns to bringing one of these grouper up and onto the boat for the standard tagging procedure. So we're ready to fish. I'm going to send my bait and weight over the side, drop it to about 90 feet, then I'm going to send it back away from the boat using this large float. The grouper, when he takes it, is going to tire himself out trying to pull this float underwater. Then it's going to be, hopefully, fairly simple for me to wind him back to the boat using a rod then we'll hand line him in. Once the fish is on board, it'll be anesthetized using clove oil in the anesthetic bath, then move to the operating sling for the tag implant and finally out into the recovery bath before release. Oh, whoa, whoa. As soon as Neil's line hits the reef, a grouper takes the bait. Yep, there he is. 
This is a grouper. No question, he's pulling like a train. There's about 30 pounds of drag on this. And we're going to try and get him into the boat. We're not going to bring him in too quickly because we don't want him to get too puffed up with gas. As the fish rises, the gases in its body expand, pressurizing the fish from the inside. By slowing the grouper's ascent, Neil tries to reduce the effects of barotrauma. Just like when we've done a dive and we do a safety stop, I'm going to do a safety stop on this fish. The team's getting everything ready behind me. See if we can get this fish into the boat and into the anesthetic solution and get this tag placed. So he's got some marks on him where he's obviously been down into the rocks. When we first felt the bite, I felt him get snagged in the rocks. And then as he came out, so I was able to pull him up to the surface. So here we go. Ready? Yeah. Dylan and Oscar position their gloved hands carefully on the inside edge of the gill plate to lift the grouper up and onto the boat. Once in the sling, the team moved the animal into the anesthetic bath. So we've got him in the sling, we've got his gills in the water, and we've got the anesthetic solution not only in the bath, but also being pumped over his gills. So we're just going to get him back in the sling. Then as soon as we think that he's lost his ability to kick, we're going to lift him out and put him in the operating table. Yeah, because you, you got the gloves, if you want to maybe hold them upright, yeah. that's probably the better way to go. The clove oil enters the grouper's body through the gills. Once in the bloodstream, it slows the grouper's respiration and heart rate until it's fully anesthetized. So, Tammy, we can see this fish is a percular moving in and out. What do you think yeah. about his condition? I think he looks pretty good, Neil. His color's still pretty good. So um, he is a little scraped up from, yeah. the, from the reef, but his color's really good. So, um, and, he's, and his operculum is coming in and out, so he's breathing fairly well. I think that's enough. Yeah. Right. So I now say. I think we've got him anesthetized enough. We're now going to yeah. lift him out, turn him upside down, put him in our sling. So I've prepped my surgery site with some iodine, just as I would when I was doing any operation in my operating theater at Ensmead. Now I'm going to take my surgical blade. This is a little stronger than my average scalpel blade because it's a tough fish. I'm going to make a cut in his abdomen just off the midline. Squeamish, look away. So there we are, I'm through to his abdomen. I'm gonna now extend that cut a tiny bit and I'm gonna insert my tag. Here it is, this is my satellite tag. The magnet's been taken off, it's already transmitting. It goes into the body cavity as simply as that. Close the body cavity, now I'm gonna stitch him up. What actually makes it difficult suturing these fish is not the skin, it's the scales. They have leather, just as any animal skin is leather but they also have these scales, which can get caught on the tip of this needle. I'm delighted with how this has gone so far. I have to say, Dr. Trot, I think we're making excellent time, are we not? Yes, you are. So Dr. Trot is also gonna place a National Marine Fisheries tag in this fish, which will be an external identification. Let us know this fish has been tagged before. Of course, the acoustic tag cannot be seen by anybody, and nobody is gonna see this little suture line on this big grouper. The final stage of the process is to lower the grouper into the recovery bath. Fresh seawater flushes the clove oil from the animal and prepares it for release. So he's starting to uh, use his pectoral fins much more. His respiration rate is coming up. He's waking up. We're just waiting to, for him to get a writing reflex, for him to try and bring himself into an upright position. It's a bit difficult because he is still gassed, remember? But once he's fighting a bit more, then we're going to take him to the back and let him go. Okay. Yeah, you got him. That. I'll go a little. Choi has opted to use a small weight. Okay. The weight will pull the animal back down to the reef, allowing its gases to recompress. Tammy has also released some of its gases with a hypodermic needle. This is a common procedure and ensures the fish makes it back to its original catch depth. Yeah. Whenever you guys are ready, I'll follow you because you're three, lifting. Two, two, one, go. Yeah. I'm just securing the weight. You guys have all the fish's weight. The weight the fish. Despite the team's care, this fish has been through a very invasive right. procedure. Yeah. But this procedure has protected this species from local extinction for several years. Just make two, one, down. Yeah. As a veterinarian, Neil's primary concern is always the welfare of the animals he's working with. 
The team hope the new tag trap will vastly reduce the need for such invasive procedures in the future. Oh, so it looked like it went great. The release weight pulled him nicely down. What happened when we popped it off? Yeah, it was amazing. The, the release weight worked perfectly. It went down, popped off one time, no jerking or whatever. And then it swam off and then hit in a little reef for a little bit. I'm ecstatic. Great job. Well done, Joy. Good well job, done, team. Boys. Yeah. Well done, everybody. Thanks, Take the camera. Yeah, you got the cap. With one grouper oh, yeah. successfully tagged, Neil's attention quickly turns to the new tagging trap the team deployed earlier. So the trap position is bad, trapped between these two coral spires. It hasn't caught any grouper, but it has caught the invasive lionfish. These fish were released by unsuspecting aquarists near Florida and have multiplied and traveled up the Gulf Stream to Bermuda. With a powerful sting and no natural predators, these small fish may not only render my trap ineffective, they may destroy the marine ecosystem that I hold so dear. Pacific lionfish have no natural predators in the Atlantic Ocean. They breed at an alarming rate and eat all the native baby fish. One of the most effective ways to remove them is to kill them. Although this may seem cruel, invasive lionfish are outbreeding, out-eating, and out-competing every other native fish in the Western Atlantic. If left unchecked, lionfish will locally destroy the entire marine ecosystem. This special container keeps me safe from those dangerous stinging spines. The venom can burn like fire, and the effects can last for several months. With the lionfish safely in the container, Neil and the team maneuver the trap into a better position for it to be left overnight. The following morning brings in unfavorable weather. So the sea stage has got a little worse since we were last out, but we're just gonna head down to our fish spot and see if there are any groupers inside. If there are, we're gonna plant the tag into them while they're in the pot and then release them, avoiding the necessity of bringing them to the surface and causing that barrow draw. The team slowly makes their descent down towards the trap. This is the last opportunity they have to prove the new tagging system works. Neil is understandably apprehensive. Working at this depth is difficult. If I exert myself, it changes the amount of bottom time available to work. So it's a calm and slow descent through to 125 feet. The bad visibility and increased current makes it hard for the team to spot the trap. Eventually, Neil finds the sand hole and makes his final descent. I finally found the trap, and we have one very large black grouper inside it. He seems to be sitting in there nicely. This is perfect. This is exactly what Neil was hoping for. This fish doesn't need to be raised to the surface to be tagged. It won't suffer from barrel trauma and will be far less stressed when it's released. I can use the dimensions of this trap to estimate the size of this fish. He's around four feet long and about 85 to 90 pounds. He's calm, he has no barrel trauma. That's exactly what we wanted to achieve. It's time for the tag. Neil is using a tag designed to be tethered to the fish. Again, it's less invasive and only causes the fish a brief moment of discomfort. So a little jump there, but nothing unexpected. Time to open the trap door and release this fish. The success of this tagging trap may well set the benchmark for working with these fish in the future. Obtaining the same results, but with a less invasive procedure is surely a good thing for these precious animals. So what we've achieved is the same procedure that we would normally complete topside. However, in this case, the fish has remained in its own environment. It has no barotrauma, very little stress, and didn't need any anesthesia. Although it's more dangerous for us, I'm extremely happy with today's outcome.
So before we head home, I'm going to put a bait down and try and capture one of these grouper. And we're going to try something different. We're going to bring him up to about 35, 40 feet down, below the depth at which that gas accumulation becomes a problem. And I'm going to dive down and try and implant a tag in him while he's attached to the leader below the surface. Something new and different that we haven't tried before, but we hope it'll work. As soon as the line hits the reef, a grouper takes the bait. Neil immediately passes the rod to Oscar and jumps in, making his way down to meet the fish. All right, right now we've got maybe about a 60-pound grouper on the line. Dylan just told us he's at about maybe 40 feet. I'm going to bring him up a little bit to about 30, a good uh, depth so that Neil can come down with the tag in him. Neil eventually meets with the fish at around 40 feet, just before the effects of barotrauma take hold. He takes aim and implants the final external acoustic tag. Okay, that wasn't easy, but I have managed the placement of our tether tags in this fish. He's around 70 pounds. Now I'm gonna remove the hook. As soon as the hook is free, Neil swims the grouper down about 20 feet until it starts to swim itself back down to the reef. It is the first successful midwater tagging of a Bermudian black grouper and represents another method of lowering the invasive nature of previous tagging studies. Ocean vet! This is how we do it. Conditions are less than favorable. If it were if it was pond vet, it would be flat. But it's ocean vet. This is what you can expect. By working with these animals in their own environment, the team have reduced the invasive and somewhat stressful nature of the standard tagging procedure. They've proved that it's certainly not necessary to take these fish out of the water to be tagged. Since the filming of this project, the Department of Fisheries have confirmed the no fish zones require no further expansion. The Ocean Vet team have helped ensure the group remains sufficiently protected for another year. Next time on Ocean Vet, Neil and the team are on a mission to document the different species and the movements of Bermuda's inshore night sharks. Faced with dangerous night dives, heavy equipment, and new tracking technology, this project proves to be the team's most demanding yet. We've got a male tiger shark, juvenile male tiger shark. After several exhausting attempts, Neil and the team finally implant an acoustic tag into none other than a shallow water Bermuda tiger shark. This is Dr. Neil Burney. He lives in Bermuda, a stunning Atlantic island 640 miles east of North Carolina, USA. So now the, yeah. He spent the last 30 years practicing veterinary medicine, but now he's transferring his veterinary skills to help save, protect, and learn more about the incredible marine life of Bermuda's ocean. This is a completely wild shark. Alongside his dedicated ocean vet team are a number of scientists, yeah, this and here, marine biologists, off the back fin. and specialist master divers, helping to perform a number of unique and dangerous procedures in a bid to safeguard critically important marine species. Together, the team will be fitting satellite tags to huge tiger sharks, saving precious green turtles, dissecting giant blue marlin, and obtaining unique toxin samples from 45-ton migrating humpback whales. Yay! Whoa! My knees are like jello. Yes, man. This is Bermuda, home to Dr. Neil Burney, the ocean vet. glorious waters off the coast of Bermuda are home to one of the most coveted game fish species in the world, the giant blue marlin. The blue marlin is the largest of the Atlantic marlins and one of the biggest fish in the world. Native to tropical and temperate waters, the blue marlin is among some of the most recognizable of all fish. Joey's gonna hold him up, I'm gonna plot the tag. In this incredible episode, Neil and the Ocean Vet team are on a scientific mission to satellite tag one of these powerful animals. 
Their aim is to collect marlin movement data and provide the information to an international billfish conservation project. We've decided that although blue marlin fishing requires a great deal of patience, we haven't got quite enough. After several grueling hours at sea, the team's luck changes when a sports fishing boat decides to hand over a huge blue marlin for the tagging procedure. This fish is going to swim, man. He's the dorsal's up, he's going to swim, I tell you. On occasions, these monster fish are caught and killed in fishing competitions. Utilizing the body of one such fish and Neil's unique veterinary skills, the team will also be dissecting and studying the anatomy of these incredible animals. 573 pounds of blue marlin. What a magnificent fish this is. Together with unique tracking data to support this animal's conservation and the body of a marlin donated to the Ocean Vet team for research, this episode reveals the very makeup of Bermuda's famous blue marlin. So the blue marlin is considered by many to be the ultimate sport fish. Requires serious gear because its powerful runs can strip a reel of line in no time. This is a large bait that we use. We troll this behind the boat. And the reel here is capable of exerting massive amounts of drag uh, so that we can tire the fish out. Hopefully, we tire the fish out before we tire me out. Catching one of these huge fish for tagging will not be easy. Choi Aming, the series marine biologist, Andrew Kirkpatrick, the team's underwater videographer, Dylan Ward, the team's fisherman, and Oscar Doyce, the second boat captain, will all be working together to bring a blue marlin to the side of the boat. So at first glance, you may think that this is a fairly large lure, but you have to consider that a 1,000 pound blue marlin is entirely capable of eating a 200 pound yellowfin tuna in one bite. The Atlantic blue marlin are under intense fishing pressure. In the Caribbean alone, Japanese and Cuban fishermen annually take over a thousand tons of this fish. All right, we're on it. Just watch the tag on the floor. Yeah, I'll be on this side. Neil and his team's goal is to satellite tag a Bermuda blue marlin. The tag data will be sent to the Billfish Research Project and shared with fishery policymakers to help protect billfish species like the blue marlin from overfishing. It's one thing about marlin fishing. We've always got to look at how these lures are working. Captains and mates will obsess about the action of these different lures, saying this law works better in this condition, this law works better in another sea state. Personally, I think as long as it throws bubbles and a marlin's hungry, he's going to eat it. The team have been fishing the deep sides of Challenger Bank for several hours. Several other large sports fishing boats are also fishing around Bermuda's banks. In an attempt to increase the team's chances of tagging a blue marlin, Dylan puts out a radio message offering $1,000 to any boat that transfers a large blue to the team. It looks like their plan may have worked. Although blue marlin fishing requires a great deal of patience, we haven't got quite enough. Another boat has hooked up a blue, and we are going to go and take that blue, transfer it to this boat, and put a piece of tag in it. So we're pulling all our lines in, and we're heading over to the other boat right now. Neil opens the throttles on each of the 250 horsepower engines, hurtling the ocean vet boat over the ocean at 50 miles an hour straight towards the sports fishing boat Marlin Fever. En route, more information comes over the radio. They might kill it. They've already got his boat side. They've already got his boat side. It sounds like the animal may be killed as a contender for the Bermuda Marlin World Cup. The Marlin World Cup is held in Bermuda each year and has a 98% release ratio. But if a marlin is large enough, it may be killed for a top prize. However, the World Cup donates hundreds of thousands of dollars to conservation projects established to ensure the number of these fish now and in the future. Yeah, look at his dorsal going up. All right. In total, sport represents only 1% of blue marlin mortality. 
and all fish killed are eaten or donated for scientific research. Snap swivel is coming. Gab a pentin bottle as a fat. Back in the action, Neil and the team have reached marlin fever, and the fish is still alive. All right, so uh, marlin fever is going to donate their blue to us. We're going to give them our snap swivel. We're going to take over the fish. We are going to land it on bones, and we're going to put a piece out archival tag in it. What would you like to call it? Well, well, we'll call you back on the dock. You can tell us what you want to call the fish, and we'll get your email so we can send you guys the track and everything. Yeah. Choi has now transferred Neil's fishing line to Marlin Fever, where their crew have attached it to the leader hooked to the fish. Good, let him go. Neil now has control of this blue marlin. So we now have a blue marlin on the line. We're going to bring him over to our boat. We're going to lead him on our boat. And we're going to put a piece that archival tag in this fish. And we're going to track it around the ocean. And she's, he's swimming right now. I can feel him pulsing below me right here. In the background, the Ocean Vet team are scrambling to ready the boat and equipment needed to handle this fish. The blue marlin is under the boat, making slow circles, swimming strongly. We're just getting our team organized. OK, now I want you to idle forwards, keeping the fish on the port side of the boat. Once the animal is at the surface and within reach, Dylan quickly inserts the water hoses to pump oxygen over the animal's gills. I can see the color returning to this fish as we're pumping this oxygenated water over his gills. It really seems to be doing a great job of reviving him. I'm going to jump in the rib. We're going to put the tag in this fish and let him go. Just watch the tag on the floor. Time is now of the essence. The welfare of this animal is Neil and the team's top priority. Stress can easily kill these gigantic fish. I'm ready to place the tag. I've pre-made the hole. You ready? Bring him in a little closer. Tag is placed. Check it. Tag is placed. And firmly check. That's it. The tag is in. Peace out tag is deployed in this fish. Good luck, buddy. I'm going to jump overboard. Next, Neil jumps in to prepare for the release. Neil, what's happening? This fish is going to swim, man. He's the dorsal's up. He's going to swim, I tell you. OK, let it go. I think you can release him. In six months, the tag will drop off this fish and transmit its data to satellites hundreds of miles above. The tag on this fish, among others, is providing the data needed to legislate protection and enhance conservation for this economically and ecologically important species. So, so that was it. Yeah, the Ocean Vet yeah. team has tagged and released the blue marlin out here on Bermuda's Challenger Bank, exactly as we'd hoped to do so. And the good news is we didn't have to spend six days ourselves fishing for it. Woo! Patience is a virtue, but sometimes the impatient actually can do better. Yeah. Next, the Ocean Vet team are preparing to dissect a 573-pound blue marlin. So it's the morning of our dissection. We're here at the Spanish Point Boat Club, and we have a large blue marlin. We're going to open this fish up and see exactly the internal anatomy of this amazing marine giant. Choi and Ming. Hey. Oscar Doyce. And Dylan Ward are our team. It's going to take all of us to cut this fish apart. This marlin has been killed for sport in the Bermuda Marlin World Cup, an international sports fishing competition. Although initially concerning, it's important to understand that sports fishermen donate hundreds of thousands of dollars to major conservation and research projects. Fortunately, my wife is off island at present and does not realize that her favorite kitchen knives are going to be used for cutting up this rather large fish. Neil and the team will be dissecting this fish in an attempt to show how much of an evolutionary miracle this species really is. Rather than it being served up, the team are seizing an opportunity to educate and share its impressive secrets. Neil believes that by increasing the public's understanding of this species, it's possible to inspire greater conservation. Wow, check the size of this fish. She is incredible. 
Over 500, so yeah, you're right. It's definitely a she. Definitely a female. 573 pounds of blue marlin. What a magnificent fish this is. So Choi, what, what do we think the function is of this massive bill on this fish? Well, these guys love to um, they go in as schools of uh, prey fish. What they do is they'll charge right in and they'll actually slash back and forth, almost like a sword fighter with a sword. And they're hoping to uh, injure, damage, you know, even kill the fish right there. And then they go ahead and eat it. And not only that, they've, uh, they've actually skewered fish in the past. And in fact, there's one local fisherman, Ian Card, was transfixed by one, a bill on a fish bigger than this, apparently, which took him right through under the collarbone. And the fish took him out of the boat, 30 feet down under the water, he was lucky to survive. The fish never touched the boat. 30 feet through the air, six feet above water, took a 180 pound guy out of the boat. Yeah, I've heard that story and it's, I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine. The marlin's agility and extraordinary power has evolved over thousands of years to ensure that the animal can successfully hunt. This agility and power is provided by massive muscle groups that run down each side of the animal's body. These muscles are on the front line of ensuring the animal's survival. Removing and revealing these muscle groups is the team's first step to understanding how this animal's body functions. So Choi's making his first cut along the lateral line of this fish. We're gonna try to remove the dorsal fillet, the main muscle group running down the back of this fish in one or two pieces. I'm gonna join him, I'm gonna cut from here, and my cut's gonna join his, I'm gonna remove this muscle. The animal has two types of muscle that have evolved to support different swimming behavior. Neil has taken a sample of the combined muscle to the inspection mat for a closer look. So here we have the loin of our marlin. I'm gonna cut right through it here and show you the two different muscle masses. This is his anaerobic, his fast twitch muscle. This is what gives him his huge amount of power. As this contracts either side of his spine and flexes him, it generates a rear-facing wave of motion which powers him out of the water. Tail walks, spectacular. He can pull a 12-ton fishing boat backwards through the water. This, on the other hand, is his red muscle, which allows this fish to travel thousands of kilometers looking for food without burning any energy. As we released our fish, he swam away on this muscle. This was not tired. This muscle was shattered. Blue marlin are able to recover from extreme spells of exhaustion and travel thousands of miles by switching between their different muscle types. Feeding both these muscle groups with vital oxygen is the job of the animal's huge gills. Choi and Neil have removed the protective gill plate to take a closer look. So yesterday we had a fish alongside the boat and we put a tag in it. What we were very careful to do was when we slowed the boat down, we put two hoses into the mouth of this fish and we sent oxygenated water from our pumps straight over the gills of this fish. And that mimicked absolutely the movement of a fish at several miles an hour through the water. These fish can ventilate enough for their slow twitch muscles when they're moving at one or two miles an hour. But when they're moving fast, they generate way more oxygenation and that's what we mimicked with our hoses. Oxygen is actually pulled out of the water by the gills and it actually transfers through little filaments right into the bloodstream. And these are very, very fine structures. Blood passes against seawater within about a millionth of a meter, one micron. So it's a very, very tiny area. And there's actually about eight of them here times two sides. That's a huge amount of surface area that it actually has in a compact space to pick up oxygen out of the water. So you can see, even though this is a small structure, it is enough surface area to grab oxygen for a fish this size. Oxygen is the key to the animal's overall function, but so is the energy created from its food. The marlin's eyes are its secret weapon when it comes to finding this food. The function of the eyes have an incredible secret. Neil and Choi have removed the armor plating around the organ to find out more. So now that we've cut away the bony portion at the back of the orbit here, we can reveal the muscles that attach to this tough eyeball. Yeah, and right here, yeah, right where your finger is, I can see perfectly 
what's referred to as the thermogenic organ. And the thermogenic organ is effectively um, some extraocular eye muscles that sit in the back. And over time, what has happened is they have uh, evolved less in terms of the uh, contractile myofilaments, mm -hmm. and they've increased in the number of uh, mitochondria producing more ATP. So that generates a whole lot of heat. So basically, not very much elasticity or strength, but a whole lot of heat generating behind this eyeball. So we have central heating for this fish's eyeball. Exactly. And not only that, but the blood also runs into the retina, it's warm. The eye works way better when the fish is down a mile deep in the cold, cold water of the deep abyss. He can still see, the other fish can't, so he's got the upper hand. Also, his brain is receiving a blood vessel from this same heater organ, so he's got a warm brain. He doesn't get cold, he doesn't get hypothermia, he's cooking. The internal heating system in this otherwise cold-blooded animal allows the fish to spot prey effectively in cold, deep water. In order to reach this deep, cold water, the marlin uses its swim bladder, a special organ that allows the animal to quickly move up and down through the vast water column. This is fascinating, man. Look at this. We've got the swim bladder sitting here, and I believe We've got the rest of the organs located right down beneath it, right here. So here's the swim bladder. We can actually remove it from the fish. This is filled in a remarkable way. Oxygen is drawn from the bloodstream into the bladder to increase the buoyancy and bring the marlin up in the water column. In fact, anglers have seen marlin with their dorsal and tail out of the water, floating right at the surface. Then, when he needs to, oxygen can be returned to the depleted blood here at the rear of the swim bladder, reducing its buoyancy and allowing the fish to sink down, much in the same way that a diver would use a BCD, a buoyancy control device, to move up and down in the water column. The main skeletal element inside the marlin is the vertebral column. Similar to a human spine, it's composed of multiple vertebrae. In the case of the marlin, the vertebrae are considerably different. I'm good on this end. It's just that side that needs a little. A little and bit here of... we have it. And what you may be able to see here, it's difficult to see, but the actual vertebral body is here, and here, and here. And yet the spinous processes are separated by some two inches on either side. So basically, we've got an interlocking vertebral body system, which gives this fish this flexibility, and yet this rigidity. So when those big, powerful muscles pull this fish from side to side, it's like a spring driving him through the water and powering him into the air. Neil and Choi have revealed some of the blue marlin's impressive anatomy and shared a few of its truly remarkable features. Features that have enabled this fish to thrive throughout our planet's oceans. But one part of the marlin's anatomy has evolved above all others. The blue marlin's tail. So we've seen how the muscle and the vertebral column generate the power that goes to the tail. Here it is, the most efficient oscillating propeller that we know. This, when driven through the water, can produce speeds of over 40 miles an hour for this fish and throw it 30 feet through the air. Guess what? I have almost an exact replica, and this is the latest modern computer-designed foil for my windsurfer. Look how remarkably similar it is to what nature has achieved after natural evolution has occurred over millions of years. The marlin had it right all along. A variable aspect foil, brilliant in design. Dissecting an animal like this has provided me with a unique opportunity to learn more about this creature. Like so many marine species, they are often out of sight, out of mind. This has reaffirmed to me why we work so hard to protect all marine species. They deserve our attention. They have developed into such remarkable creatures. Neil and the team continue to work with the sports fishing community and plan to tag more blue marlin in the coming years. I'm ready to place the tag. The tag on this fish revealed the marlin traveled 300 miles north of Bermuda. It was likely following the Gulf Stream's temperature gradient. This cold and warm water meeting point tends to accumulate marine life. 
it's highly likely this blue marlin was in pursuit of food. I think you're gonna release it. Sadly, the tag malfunctioned and popped off just after this journey. Consequently, no long range migration was recorded. Neil and the team will be continuing their work to gather more data. Data that will ultimately help protect this species long into the future. Next time on Ocean Vet, Neil and the team join the Bermuda Turtle Project, helping to collect vital data in a bid to improve the numbers of green sea turtles around the world. He actually looks in pretty good shape. Neil will also be rescuing sick green sea turtles from Bermuda's beaches to rehabilitate and release them back into the wild. We wish this guy all the best. He has a tough road ahead as he continues on his epic journey. Good luck, little one. This is Dr. Neil Burney. He lives in Bermuda, a stunning Atlantic island 640 miles east of North Carolina, USA. So now the, yeah. He spent the last 30 years practicing veterinary medicine, but now he's transferring his veterinary skills to help save, protect, and learn more about the incredible marine life of Bermuda's ocean. This is a completely wild shark. Alongside his dedicated ocean vet team are a number of scientists, yeah, this and here, marine this biologists, off the back fin. and specialist master divers, helping to perform a number of unique and dangerous procedures in a bid to safeguard critically important marine species. Together, the team will be fitting satellite tags to huge tiger sharks, saving precious green turtles, dissecting giant blue marlin and obtaining unique toxin samples from 45-ton migrating humpback whales. Yay! Whoa! My knees are like jello. Yes, man. This is Bermuda, home to Dr. Neil Burney, the ocean vet. The spotted eagle ray is one of the most strikingly beautiful marine animals, covered in a spotted pattern that is unique to each and every ray. In Bermuda, these rays are heavily protected, but throughout some of the rest of the world, it's a different story. Now categorized as near threatened, the future survival of this species is uncertain. Straight into the ice, actually in this position, it's perfect. Yeah, yeah. Oxygen on. In this episode, Neil and his ocean vet crew patrol Bermuda's beautiful inshore waters on a scientific mission to protect the spotted eagle ray. I can handle a probe if you wish. Utilizing his extensive veterinary skills, Neil and his ocean vet team will perform a number of unique procedures to collect vitally important data from these beautiful marine animals. So we'll give this to you and you can slide this under him. By employing tried and tested capture methods alongside some of the very latest technology, Neil and his crew's skill will be tested to the limit as they attempt to corral and capture these rays in some of Bermuda's most idyllic surroundings. You never know what you're gonna find here in the Bermuda Triangle. To assist him on this testing mission, Neil has assembled his ocean vet crew at the Bermuda Aquarium dock. This weather, this day, epic. We're gonna get three or four rays today, for sure. As always, Neil is assisted by series marine biologist Choi Aming, underwater cameraman Andrew Kirkpatrick, boat pilot Dylan Ward, and support rib pilot Oscar Doyce. The team are also joined by spotted eagle ray scientist Dr. Matt Ajamian, ultrasonographer Lati Reining, aerial drone pilot Johnny Singleton, and Chris Fluck from Bermuda Conservation Services. Their combined experience and expertise is essential to the success of Neil and his crew's mission. So about four or five years ago, Dr. Matt Ajamian carried out his PhD work on Bermuda's spotted eagle rays. He answered a lot of the questions about their feeding behavior and their local migratory movements. However, two key questions remain unanswered. One, does our population of eagle rays differ from those found in the Gulf of Mexico? And secondly, do any of our rays undergo long-term migrations from the Bermuda platform? 
This year, we're going to take a lot of DNA samples from some of these fish, and also, we're going to attach archival satellite tags, and that way, hopefully, we can answer long-term migratory movement questions on these fish. Exact tag that we're putting on a lot of By attaching satellite tags and collecting DNA samples, Neil and his team can determine if these rays migrate off island and how their genetic identity compares with other ray populations. So these rays that we're seeing here, this is about an average size female. Combined with Matt's previous data, this will prove if this species is totally endemic to Bermuda. This would be a scientific breakthrough. If Bermuda's spotted eagle rays are proved to be endemic, then the conservation data on these protected rays can be used as a benchmark for unprotected populations, helping to establish an effective conservation strategy to protect this species all over the world. All right, so the first thing we need to do is get a ray. So what we're gonna do is head out in this boat using this jack net, put it in the water and circle the ray, put it on the boat and then transport it back here to the aquarium where we're gonna take our samples and attach our satellite tag. Now rays are very powerful and potentially dangerous. So the first thing we're gonna do is put it into this anesthesia bath here. So here's our pool set up. We've got oxygenated water in here and we're gonna use clove oil to anesthetize our fish. Matt, why are we choosing clove oil for our anesthetic? Well, Neil, clove oil is a naturally occurring uh, anesthetic and it has a variety of uses, but really is effective on marine fishes and uh, should put these rays under in a comfortable level so we can do all of our procedures. Excellent. And it's a naturally occurring material, so we have no problems with disposal that you do with some of the synthetic anesthetic agents. Let's go catch an eagle ray. Let's do it. Matt's research proved that Harrington Sound is an eagle ray hotspot. This large body of inland water provided over 50 sightings during Matt's study. These rays were often observed cruising the perimeter of the sound or gliding across the shallow bays of some of its beautiful islands. So we're here at a fantastic location on the backside of Trunk Island here in Harrington Sound. This is a great location to try and find eagle rays because this sand bed here is full of calico clams, one of their preferred foods. Hopefully, we'll find two or three in here. Once sighted, encircling these rays with a capture net requires a great deal of skill and experience. These fish are fast, unpredictable, and highly maneuverable. So we found our first eagle ray. It's up here on the shallow sand flats right behind the island. What we're gonna do? Uh, I want you to come like up here somewhere. Right? Mm -hmm. Very exciting. So we're deploying the net. We've come right in against the shoreline. We're deploying the net, and we're going to try and capture this ray. Yeah, yeah. Just guide it. Don't touch it. All right, cool. So we can see our ray is about 20 yards off the bow of the boat, and he's heading towards the corner where we put the net to start with. This is going perfectly at the moment. Lottie's going to jump in the water just to kind of give the ray a bit of a scare towards the net because sometimes they go one way or the other. So we like to have a swimmer in there just to have a body there and it kind of scares the ray in one direction and that ensures us being able to net it. Lottie also has the crucial task of closing off any gaps at the bottom of the net. Even the smallest hole can be an escape route for one of these rays. At the surface, Oscar and Matt have the challenging task of trying to maneuver the heavy net around this ray without it escaping. See if you can scare him into the bay, Oscar. Just do your best. This is like cat and mouse with an eagle ray, highly mobile and actually highly intelligent. They have one of the biggest brain sizes per body mass of any fish. And this guy is trying to outwit us right here, right now. But not to be outmaneuvered by this ray, Neil deploys the rest of his team to close off any escape routes. This is a crucial moment. One slip now, and his team could lose this ray for good. So the eagle ray is right here in front of us, heading towards Chris. Our job right now is to keep him corralled as we gradually get this net smaller and smaller so we can capture this ray. 
The reason we brought the camera is because uh, the Eagle Rays actually have a spotted pattern on the back and it's actually a unique spot pattern on every ray. So if we get a good photo of it, it's like a fingerprint. So what Matt's gonna do is uh, he's gonna keep them and basically we can catalog all the rays so we can identify each individual ray by its pattern. So we'll give this to you and you can slide this under him. Neil and his team must be extremely careful working close to this animal. These rays are equipped with several venomous barbs located at the base of their tails. If one of these barbs were to puncture a vital organ, the effects could be fatal. Okay. All right, you guys got that? Right, Do you yeah. have that right now? Huh? Yeah, yeah. I have it. You got the tape? I'm good. Yeah, the tape's right here. Do you want to... So we have our ray safely in the boat. I'm going to get the tape, and we're going to tape its barbs. These are the very dangerous five to six inch long venomous barbs and sadly made most famous by the death of the late Steve Irwin who took a six inch long stingray barb through the heart. We're gonna make sure that doesn't happen to any of us. We're gonna tape these barbs up close to his tail to get out of the danger. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. Our priorities are taping up the barbs and getting water into his yeah. gills. So I'm holding the mouth open. Matt has just put water in the gills so he's got flow over the gills. You can see water coming out there. He's in good shape. We're just going to put a towel over his eyes just so he can't see what's going on to keep his stress level low. Okay. You can actually see this guy. With the ray now secure and stabilized, Neil is satisfied it can be safely transported back to the Bermuda Aquarium. So we're running full speed and Matt is checking the flow and the water is flowing over his gills. And we're almost at the aquarium. We're almost there. This guy has become one of the Ocean Vet research crew. He's being honored to be allowed to wear the shirt. Very nice. Good job, everybody. Yeah. What a wicked team. Neil and his team have successfully transported their captured ray back to the Bermuda Aquarium for sampling. Straight into the hands, thanks. In this position, it's perfect. Yeah, yeah. Oxygen on? Yeah, OK, we'll turn it on now. So our ray is in his anesthetic solution. He's in the clove oil. He's gradually going to get a little sedated, we hope. And then we're going to go ahead. We're going to get a blood sample. We're going to get a DNA clip. And we're going to attach our archival satellite tag. To minimize unnecessary stress to this animal, Neil is keen to complete the procedures as quickly as possible. All right, thanks, Matt. So this is our archival pop-off tag. And we're going to implant this. It's going to release after six months. It's going to come to the surface and deploy and upload all the information about this ray's movements during those six months. We're That's going right. to put this right through the muscular tissue either side of the vertebra of this fish's tail. That's right. And it's going to go right through, just like so. And as it gets pushed through, uh, this tube is going to go with it. And as you can see, this ray is not bothered by this procedure. The clove oil is working brilliantly. All so right. now so I'm going to plant the tube on this side, correct? Right here. This is very similar to some of the procedures we use when we're doing our small animal practice, particularly when I'm doing fracture repairs in small cats or dogs. We thread a wire under the jaw in exactly the same way. Beautiful. So we have a smooth connection from our swivel, from our tag, to our swivel, to our fish, to our ray, I should say, and we're good to go. This is going to trail behind him and offer minimal drag as he swims through the water column. With the health of this ray also a key focus, Neil, Choi, and Matt take some vital blood samples. So Matt, why are we going to draw this blood sample from this ray? This blood's going to actually give us a little insight into the physiology of these animals, how healthy they are, what types of toxins are actually in them as well. And we can also use some of this tissue that we're going to draw from our clip to get DNA analysis, right, and compare right this with other populations. Yes, sir. This DNA sample will be sent to scientists in California and compared with other ray populations to determine if Bermuda's rays are indeed genetically unique. Good, okay, we're good. All right, let's get so back. let's move this back. ray. With the welfare of this ray Neil's top priority, he's keen to begin reviving the animal as soon as possible. It's starting to come out a little bit, which is good. Okay, all right, so we've got the ray moved into our recovery bath. We've got our oxygenation stone in. Choi is actually running fresh water directly over his gills. We're going to get rid of all that clove oil anesthetic from this fish, wake him up, get him weighed, and get him back into the oh ocean. Yeah, there he goes. Yeah. Pumping I can hard. feel it. It's like almost like a little tongue sticking out, licking my hand. 
With all of their procedures taking just over 10 minutes, Neil has ensured the stress to this ray has been kept to a minimum. Okay, we're going to lift him onto the frame. And with the clove oil solution now purged from this ray, Neil is confident the animal is strong enough to be released. So, do you want to grab the back end? Got to grab the back end. OK, let's get him off. So I'm just bringing him off. And as we can see, I can assess his spherical movement. And we're going to wait until we have some movement oh. of his fins. And once we do, we're going to see he's already starting to move. So we're now in a position to release the vet wrap from his tail, leave his barbs free. And just for the audience above here who's looking down, this is what we do not want to get caught by. I so this it. one, these venomous barbs are what we were trying to avoid earlier. But now as we release this fish, we can leave him with his protection in case he comes into contact with something that he needs to protect himself from in the future. In Bermuda, this animal faces threats from large marine predators such as tiger sharks and even hammerheads. But in other oceans, these animals are also hunted by bull sharks and black tips. I think he's, yeah. he's getting ready to go. So I'm so ready, whenever, Joy? Yeah, whenever you, you got guys him? release, I'll just follow him just to ensure that he looks good and swims away healthy. There he goes, and he's gliding down as we watch him. Yeah. Perfect. So that's our first eagle ray tagged and released. We've got a few more to go, but it's looking very good so far. Neil and his team will have to wait and see if the DNA samples and satellite tag data corroborate Matt's theory that Bermuda's eagle rays are endemic to the island. But it's not just strategies like this that help ensure this animal's survival. At the Bermuda Aquarium, their team of scientists also respond to reports of injured marine animals. When a call comes in about an injured spotted eagle ray, Neil and his ocean vet crew are the first to respond. So we've received a call from a resident of Harrington Sound just up here. He's seen an injured eagle ray in front of his property. It looks like he's got a laceration to the wing and some abrasions, and it's circling in the same place all the time, so it doesn't look well. We're going to see if we can assess it in the water, and if we think it needs to be captured to help treat it, that's what we're going to do. Oh, hang on. Hang on, he's right in front of us. So you got a spot on him? He's right in front of us. He's right here. Looky, he's 20 yards off the stern of the boat. Right there, right? And he's heading out right now. So we can see the laceration on the left side of the wing, and it's about a third of the way in from the tip. But the ray is adapting to it and is swimming pretty strongly right now. It's incredible considering it's almost the, the wing is actually cut, and basically it's kind of flat like a chunk, like tilting like that. But she still managed to swim fine, so it just shows the resiliency of these animals. I won't say it's cosmetic, but I don't think it's life-threatening. Yeah. And so I think the stress of us bringing her in, in a pr already a stressed animal, and further stressing it, I think, would not be the best call. So that's the call for now. We're not going to net this ray, and we're going to leave her be, but we're going to monitor her. That's exactly what we should do. Back at the dock, Neil and his team are keen to go in search of a second ray, but there's a problem. So unfortunately, we've developed an oil leak on one of our engines, which has basically stopped us from using this boat. So we've transferred the net out, and we're going to go with the aquarium boat called the Chevron. Floggy, what do you think? Things happen if you just go with the punches. Got to roll with roll it, man. Got to roll with it. Keep smiling. Going to go hunt for an eagle ray, just using a different boat. With time slipping away, this could be their final chance. So we've just seen a ray coming along the edge of this shoreline over here to behind me. We're going to park the net on this promontory here, and we're going to reverse back and try and encircle this ray in the bay. We've got the helicopter up over the net. We're going to see if he can spot him. Neil and his team face a much sterner challenge this time. The overall visibility is poor, and the lead lining at the bottom of the net is entangled on the seabed. So I'm going to go and try and be another hand on the lead line, try and get it freed up so we can get around this ray. Neil's drone has zeroed in on the ray's location, and the team now face the challenging task of trying to free the net without letting the ray escape. Four feet off the bottom. All right, Look, come on this side and tend the hole down. I'm trying to, there's a four foot hole under All the ray. Right, the hole. If you don't tend that hole. As the team begins to think they might lose this ray, Neil and Andrew Kirkpatrick spot it, making a break for a gap in the net. 
My ray identification skills are good. It is a female. With the ray now located and the net freed from the bottom, Neil and the team can maneuver it into a safe position for capture. The ray is right down in here. We're just about to pinch everything off and lift her out of the water. It is a girl, exactly what we've been looking for. The fact this ray is a female is hugely significant. It means that Neil can ultrasound this ray to see if it is carrying pups. Data on this animal's reproductive cycle is extremely rare and would be a significant addition to the other data they've collected. So we're on the run, heading as fast as we can back to the aquarium dock. We have the ray comfortably covered, eyes are covered. The water, watch this water flowing out of these spiracles. Beautiful, it means she's being well oxygenated by the water from the barrel of the back. Back at the aquarium, Neil and his team's priority is to anesthetize the animal as quickly as possible. So we're bringing the ray straight up and into the anesthetic. Beautiful. Although at first the ray appears distressed, by temporarily covering its eyes and allowing the clove oil to take effect, the animal is soon calm and fully anesthetized. So we're going to bring Lottie Reining from Dolphin Quest in, who's our ultrasonographer. And she's gonna let us see whether there are any immature rays inside this adult ray. So Lottie, what do you think? Let's see, Exciting let's stuff. have a look. Right. So we'll slide her a little bit forward so that you can reach. She seems really comfortable Perfect. in this anesthetic solution. I'm just gonna move the camera out of the way a little bit. So what we're looking for is movement within the stilomic or body cavity. If there are any small rays, they'll be rather like little wrapped up tacos folded up on themselves. And there can be up to two or three, correct? Up to four, actually. Up to four. Yeah. Female rays will mature from between four and six years old and give birth to live pups after one year of pregnancy. This ray is quite small for a pregnant female, and so it's possible she's not yet carrying pups. So I'm seeing no evidence of uh, juvenile rays within this adult female, so I think we're free to go ahead and put our tags in this fish, do our DNA clips, and take our blood samples. OK, I lost the vacuum on that one. Although this ray will not provide any reproductive data for Neil and his team, she can still provide important migratory data via her satellite tag and crucial DNA samples for genetic analysis. There we go. She's going to start to swim. Here she goes. The release of this spotted eagle ray concludes a scientific journey that has seen Neil and his team pushed to their absolute limits. Capturing these rays has not been easy, but working together, the team has succeeded. Fantastic. To see that fish swim away strongly into the current of Flats Inlet, just beautiful. These fish deserve our attention and our respect and understanding. If this population can continue to thrive in Bermuda, they can be ambassadors for the ocean. Good job, buddy. Teamwork makes the dream work. Since the filming of this program, the satellite tracking data has confirmed that these animals make no long-range migrations, but the DNA samples are a match to other eagle ray populations. The team's evidence suggests that millions of years ago, Bermuda must have been more accessible to this species. As the Earth's surface changed, so did the position of Bermuda. The result is a unique and precious population that moved with the island. The future of this species is bright, but one slip could see these glorious creatures disappear from these waters forever. Beautiful, the spotted eagle ray. Long may they reign. <laughs> Next time on Ocean Vet, Neil and his team enter the world of the tiger shark. They'll be tested to the limit as they try to install a satellite tagging computer to an 800-pound monster shark. And Neil and his team swim with these animals to see if there's any truth behind their reputation as ferocious man-eaters. Mm -hmm.